All right, you're good. Uh, so this is good. Jens Eisberg. He'll be telling us about how to make quantum computing more useful for quantum chemistry. Um, making quantum computing for quantum chemistry more useful. Um, <laughs> exciting to hear what Jens has to tell us. So please, Jens. Yes, um, thanks so very much indeed. Thanks for the very kind invitation and thanks to the organizers for all the effort and sweat of setting up this wonderful workshop on useful quantum computation for quantum chemistry. And useful is a very nice and inspiring and also a somewhat strong word in this context, given that we know how enormously challenging it is to uh, think of meaningful quantum simulations of systems in quantum chemistry on quantum computers. Still, in this talk, I will be trying to be as faithful as I can to the theme when I throw in my five pence worth on making quantum computing for quantum chemistry more useful, at least. Of course, the reason why we're all here, at least virtually in these awkward times, is that quantum computers promise to address some questions in quantum chemistry beyond the means of classical algorithms run on classical supercomputers. This promise is surely true for full-fledged, sure class, fault-tolerant quantum computers, as we do have powerful algorithms for digital quantum simulations that apply for the types of quantum chemistry problems that we have in mind. And for good reason, we had nice talks earlier today and throughout the week on this beautiful idea of a fault-tolerant quantum computer. That said, we do not quite have fault-tolerant quantum computers, and this presumably remains to be the case for the near future. What we do have are small and noisy and warm and wet, I mean, not wet, but truly noisy quantum computers. What can we do with them? And that's still too big a question to be answered within a relatively short 35 minute talk. So in this talk, we will have a look at two and a half questions around this theme when we, when we meander through the, the, the talk. The first big question we ask is, right, we can think of digital quantum simulation that does allow for capturing the dynamics of interacting quantum anybody problems and also for problems in quantum chemistry that we have in mind here. That's a beautiful idea. But to be fair, the overheads needed to do so are pretty stiff and daunting. And I will later cite a beautiful paper by Marcus and Bela and Matthias and, and, and others that nicely counted the resources necessary for a meaningful quantum chemistry simulation. And the um, outcome is, is very beautiful and, and, and accurate, but also in some ways depressing. So how can we bring down the overhead or at least reduce to some extent the enormous overhead in digital quantum simulation? That's the first, that's one of the big questions that we will ask in this talk. The other question is even more near term. When we think of of hybrid classical quantum um, algorithms that are like the types of algorithms that are presumably done with actual like present day quantum computers, where we think of the, the quantum circuit sitting in the middle as being a part as a kind of subroutine of a bigger surrounding classical algorithm where this small quantum circuit sits there in the middle um, governed by variation parameters and performs measurements collects these measurements and feeds them into the classical algorithm that does some computation, makes variation updates, iterates, making new preparation, and variationally updates the parameters of the problem in an appropriate fashion to perform this quantum classical hybrid algorithm. This is a beautiful idea. and That's kind of state of the art for many settings, also with applications in, in quantum chemistry. And the, the most basic and at the same time in the quantum chemistry presumably most useful reading of this type would be that of a variation quantum eigensolver where one makes use of the variation principle uh, over, over states 
and minimizes the energy of a fictitious or real Hamiltonian varying the variational parameters that one has to minimize the energy within this variational set, hoping to improve upon classical variational principles of this type. And that clearly has interesting applications in quantum chemistry. And we've heard exciting talks along these lines. And this is quite creating quite some excitement in the use of quantum devices in the context of quantum chemistry. And there's a lot of um, interesting questions arising here around um, notions of expressivity, of barren plateaus, and all that. In this talk, we will be looking at like a specific question in the center of this, which is asking, great, but there's a kind of a classical control problem involved. How can the burden of classical control be lessened after all to improve variational quantum schemes of this type? And the last, like the half question, depending on how, how it goes with time, is rather a reminder or an advertisement of the nice talks of Ursh, of Stephen, and of Lieber earlier and, and later this week that reminds us that in all this excitement of quantum computational settings in quantum chemistry, we should not forget that the benchmarks of classical variation algorithms are also increasing and we have a brief look at benchmarks in quantum chemistry by tensor network variational methods, or rather by tensor networks augmented by appropriate uh, mode transformations in the manifold of fermionic mode transformations. Wonderful. But let's get going and let's look at the first theme of our um, journey through the through this two and a half settings when we have a look at stochastic gradient descent for hybrid classical quantum computing. Now again, in hybrid quantum classical computing, there's this little quantum circuit sitting like in, in, in the center of things that collects measurement that's updated by a classical algorithm that updates the parameters where in one way or the other, there's a loss function that needs to be minimized that in a variation quantum eigensolver would just be the energy of some fictitious or real Hamiltonian, but it, it could also be a more sophisticated loss function at the end of the day, one kind of needs to tweak the parameters in a nice fashion so that one would kind of find the minimum of this loss function. Now, there's lots of interesting questions coming into play of like the gradients being small, of barren plateaus, of, of course, this overall variation problem being like NP hard and worst case complexity, but this shouldn't be too much of a, of a worry. I mean, after all, also the very, the, the optimization of the weights in, in deep learning, for example, would be an NP hard problem. After all, what one does in practice, one has these knobs to control and wants to find a good update of these knobs. And what is commonly done is just to find the gradient of this variational set of the cost function and then updates the parameters to make an update according to this gradient and then um, finds an, an, an kind of the, the, the closest um, optimum and hopefully the uh, close to the global optimum of, of the problem. The good news is that the gradient of this loss function can in fact be measured out at hand of the hardware by making use of measurement and expectation values at the hand of the physical hardware platform available. Someone would go into the lab and estimate the gradient for a suitable update of these variational parameters based on data at hand. And one, what one would do is one would kind of go into the lab and perform a measurement of expectation values um, of suitable observables. And then based on these expectation values, one would make the updates of these variational parameters to say in a variational quantum eigensolver, minimize the energy at hand. That's a beautiful idea, although it's less, it's more innocent looking than it than it is. Uh, we work like with um, with friends in in Heidelberg with platforms of cold atoms and optical lattices, and that's not like an optical setting where you have like megahertz repetition rate, but one shot of the experiment takes like thirty seconds in the lab. And if you tell these people, please think of estimating expectation values by repeated measurements of a type to then make use of the the to estimate the gradient they will bitterly laugh and make um, cynical 
jokes. To cite Ian Wormsley, experimentalists are not asymptotic people. One can lessen the overhead to some extent by making use of symmetries that are commonly available in circuits or in families of quantum circuits in that um, many quantum circuits would or, or gate sets would um, satisfy what is called a parameter shift rule, which would be a k-term parameter shift rule if the derivative of an expectation value with respect to some variation parameter would be given by a k-term linear combination of expectation values estimated at other variational parameters. And this can be used to kind of lessen the burden in, in, in things. But again, experimentalists are not asymptotic people. This is a pretty stiff prescription to be done in many meaningful architectures to estimate these expectation values. So how can one go about the estimation of expectation values is excessively costly. Can we think of reducing the overhead here? And what comes now is an enormously simple idea, it's, uh, and it's not very deep, no doubt about that, but it's enormously practical at the same time and works um, really incredibly well as an improvement over, over um, known, known schemes. And the inspiration is taken from stochastic gradient methods as they are ubiquitous in uh, machine learning, where one replaces the gradient-based update rule by an appropriate stochastic gradient method involving an appropriate stochastic random variable in the update rule. And um, what one does, since one goes into the lab, into this very same lab, performing the very same type of measurement and, and just doing the same thing. And the advice is, experimentalists, please go into the same lab, just measure what you can and, and send the data over, and then we will see what, what, what we do is. That's kind of the overall advice to be, to be given. Or in, 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 in slightly more precise terms, what one does is one takes measurements of the same type, of the same prescription, where one doesn't measure expectation values, but one just measures n times an observable to get an, a faithful estimator of the expectation value, but not with infinite many, many runs, but n times of, of this prescription of n being one, three, seven, just some small number getting some data and then using that data in, in the update. Well, that's the advice, just measure what you can, use the data and, and, and go about. And this allows to estimate the gradient effect very economically indeed. So the, 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 the upshot is that what this gives rise to an unbiased estimator for the expectation value um, as, as a function of the, uh, the, the uh, as a derivative with respect to the variation parameters. One also gets an unbiased estimator for the entire cost function with respect to these variation parameters in for NK settings. And indeed, putting this together, one can formulate a stochastic gradient descent rule, which is a stochastic gradient method in the, in the, in the ordinary sense, but which we dub doubly stochastic gradient descent because there's an stochasticity coming into play from the very quantum measurement that's kind of automatically random by the, by the quantum nature of the, the measurement in, in, involved. That's an enormously simple idea. The, the kind of um, pseudocode is that you iterate through the optimization steps, you iterate through the circuit parameters and make use of the parameter shift terms to really estimate an estimator for the, for the respective expectation values to construct an estimator for the gradient at the end of the of the day. We've worked this out for variation quantum eigensolvers with applications in quantum chemistry as we have them in mind here. Um, the devil is actually in the detail why the idea is uh, extremely simple. Um, the, it, it is a bit tedious, say, in the setting of quantum approximate optimization algorithms as they are multi-round schemes, but tweaking this one can still find a similar idea to work to estimate the gradient based on single shot data, although the, the proofs are a bit more elaborate, it still goes through in a, in a very similar fashion. Also, we looked at mean squared error estimators as quantum classifiers in the quantum assisted machine learning setting with nonlinear functions involved. That's again a bit nitty gritty and tedious in, in detail, but the same um, basic idea um, will just go through. Um, this is like the, the overall setting that works very well. We also took the time to think of uh, a more like mathematically minded rigorous recovery guarantee 
where we wanted to see whether it, it really works and can be proven to work. Again, the overall variation problem being NP-hard and worst case complexity, we cannot strictly speaking um, prove that we will go to the best, to the global optimum, but we can prove convergence to the best local optimum and, um, at hand where it's, it can be shown that using very mild conditions on the cost functions that are usually satisfied and a bound to the Lifshitz constant that kind of basically bounds how wobbly the cost function is, one can find that in T steps of the algorithm, like one find that, that, that the expectation of the loss function is exponentially close to the loss function at the global optimum, exponentially quickly in T the number of steps of, of the setting. So it's nice that this is not only heuristically working, but in fact, one can kind of prove convergence exponentially quickly for the number of steps in, in, in the setting, which is nice to have in this kind of heuristic, heuristic world. So again, this works very well in practice. For variation quantum eigensolvers, we also looked at quantum approximate optimization and problems in quantum assisted machine learning, where for meaningful um, m problems in quantum chemistry, one finds that in the one shot, three shot, nine shot, 27, 81 shot setting, very quickly, like already for nine shots, one is extremely close to the asymptotic setting, which is which may be simple, but it's an enormous um, reduction in the effort um, needed to make variation updates in, in, in the setting. So this works extremely well. So to cut a long story short of this first part, the lesson is by overcoming the prejudice that estimation values should be measured. Don't do it. Just shoot at the, at the setting, take the data, make the best of it. Vastly more efficient control methods for variation methods arise at the same setting, same experiment, same experimentalist, same everything. Also, the, the, the quantum, the, the classical software is easily changed and augmented. Say the beautiful package of Zapata Orchestra is making use of this in their, in their setting. It's already built in, in, their, in their database, in their software package. So that's great, but that's only kind of part of a bigger program. One can also think of natural gradients, making use of quantum or classical Fisher information, use of structure in the gradients of sparsity, low rank structure using ideas of compressed sensing combined with higher order derivatives. So we should work hard to think of better update rules of the classical control part in these um, variational settings at hand. That's the classical part. But there's also the question of what we actually want concerning expressivity of variational quantum eigensolvers, which is actually a cute problem in its own right, where like ideas of say spherical designs show that uh, like one size fits all circuits, try to express every state in the in the same fashion, which also means that they actually approximate every state pretty badly. So when we think of expressivity in variation quantum eigensolvers, it's not so easy what the actual question at hand is and what good measures of expressivity are so that we don't kind of cheat in an a priori knowledge about the quantum problem at hand when we think of notions of expressivity. I'm actually quite eager to discuss this at some point, what it even means to think of good ideas of or good notions of expressivity in the context of variation quantum eigensolvers for quantum chemistry. But 18 minutes into the talk, that's a good moment to go to the second big question that we have in mind of reducing the heavy burden of digital dynamical quantum simulations. Now, quantum digital quantum simulations, beautiful idea that works very well on fault torrent quantum computers, where we think of simulating um, the dynamics of interacting quantum systems, for example, in the co context of quantum chemistry. So for a proper quantum computer, we can ask whether quantum computers can perform digital quantum simulation for problems in quantum chemistry. And sure, yes, that's clearly the case. And that's a beautiful idea that um, we all aim for pursuing. With all the excitement, we also know that the overhead, the burden coming along with this is quite heavy and stiff. And this beautiful paper here shows how digital quantum simulation promises profound insights into quantum chemistry, but comes along with quite non-NISCI and enormous um, overheads in the, in, 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 in the settings. So it's a paper by Marcus and Nathan um, and Matthias and others that 
looks at quantum simulations of a fertilizer molecule with meaningful numbers of orbitals, counting the T gates and Clifford gates and the time required in the setting. It's a beautiful count. This is precisely the type of estimates that we need. At the same time, it seems fair to say that this is a pretty depressing count. And as a theorist, this can be seen as an invitation to work hard to think of reducing the burden and think of more efficient schemes of some type to more efficiently um, get quantum simulations done while retaining rigorous error estimates at the end of the day. So this is what we have a look at um, from now on. So the basic idea of digital quantum simulation is very clear that we think of a time evolution of some local Hamiltonian that's not necessarily geometrically local, where we have this time evolution and kind of chop time into, into pieces and look at a stroposcopic evolution of this many-body Hamiltonian with little chopped off pieces that we can think of realizing with an appropriate quantum circuit. That's a product formula. It's the most basic of all product formulas. The, the, that was also the historically first formula for digital quantum simulation as a, as a basic Trotter formula. That's great. So how do we think of implementing these Hamiltonian terms? We can think of using gates of some sort. We can also think of having Oracle access in some way to Hamiltonian terms where we just like, natively implement these Hamiltonian terms in some, some architecture. We will also allow for kind of an, an additional qubit in a controlled implementation of this Hamiltonian terms as some sort of hybrid between classical and quantum simulation. Never mind, you just implement some Hamiltonian term in a, in a stroboscopic fashion. This is a very basic product formula. It's beautiful. It's not very favorable, though, in the, in the error scaling for a given effort in the number of steps. This can be, can be beefed up. And the most sophisticated product formula I'm aware of is the Lee Trotter Suzuki formula that involves, again, odd short time slices, kind of chopping off things. But now, um, defining the terms in a recursive fashion for any positive integer xi and any positive time where the weights are picked such that the tail expansion of these capital S terms matches precisely the Trotter expressions, the, the Taylor expressions of the true many body Hamiltonian time evolution. That's a very favorable idea in the, in the error scaling where we can also bound the number of Oracle calls for a given meaningful error in the, in, in, in the right sense, say in the operator norm of the overall evolution, which is bounded by some expression for a time t, which is the overall time of the simulation discounted by the operator norm of the Hamiltonians um, coming into play. Beautiful idea, works ver very well and kind of has an, a rigorous understanding of the cancellations of errors at hand. That's great. And still, it comes along with enormous overheads, enormous um, effort. So how can we redu reduce this enormous number of Oracle calls? Now, a known method for doing so um, is the beautiful idea of a so-called multi product formula that kind of accepts that we could do better in error scaling by suitably linearly combining the previous terms that we had by putting them together linearly. And while the Trotter Suzuki approximation cancels the wrong, the erroneous contributions by adding backward evolutions, this multi product formula does so in, in a very clever way by, by superimposing the different product terms to kind of cancel the errors of a given, a given order. This is a beautiful idea. And um, that works well and gives rise to a better scaling of the errors in the setting at, at hand. And again, the effort is still quite, quite daunting. And we want to improve um, things here. Now, there's one new element coming into play. And that overcomes the prejudice that the quantum simulation has to work each time when you do the simulation. It doesn't. It's just good enough if you do some scheme, some random scheme, if we do the right quantum simulation on average, as long as 
one has a strong concentration and gets the right outcome with overwhelming probability. So enter randomness as a new element that builds on the beautiful work by Earl when he introduced the QDIF scheme in quantum simulation that um, makes use of a sampling scheme in many body um, digital time evolution. And what we have in mind here is to bring the best of both worlds together, the kind of beautiful idea of a multi-product formula on the one hand, and the idea of sampling of randomness overcoming the prejudice that things have to be running in each run perfectly, but you just sample over things and as long as you concentrate very much, you are just in business and you can reduce the overhead in a vast fashion, making giving rise to a substantially more efficient scheme of digital quantum simulation. So the basic building block is a very simple primitive that accepts that if you want to estimate the expectation value of some observable at the later time of the state conjugated by some evolution V. So this V is a probabilistic combination of a collection of unitaries. We can draw V filled circle and V empty circle from this set of unitaries with the respective probability and then perform a controlled V filled dot or anti-controlled V um, uh, empty dot circle, perform measurements, store the measurement, and then get in expectation the right outcome of the time evolved observable at a later time. Just having an, an extra qubit available, that's kind of the, the sampling qubit, but we would implement the full V like as a, as a kind, of, um, kind of digital analog um, evolution if, if, if you want. Now this can be done using Huffington's inequality as in a kind of more, more proper fashion. One gets tight bounds on the sample complexity of a randomized implementation of sums of unitaries in this fashion. That's great. One can also use this and um, formulate guarantees for approximating the time evolutions of a randomized sampling, a sampling scheme in this fashion of using an extra and still a qubit with some resolution and a finite number of measurements. And indeed, all this can be put together to combine the best of both worlds and have a randomized sampling scheme of multi-product formulas. Now the catch is that these nice known multi-product formulas are linear combinations of terms, but we don't want linear combinations. We want linear combinations with weights that are non-negative that can be interpreted as probabilities to bring that together with our kind of random sampling idea of this using this primitive that I've just shown. That one, so one really has to work hard. The details are very nitty gritty to set up new types of multi-product formulas that have the right feature of having non-negative weights of, that are put together in the, in, in the right fashion to formulate multi-product formulas that can be brought together with this random sampling scheme that we have just had a look at. And this can be done to ease the impact of the resolution of higher orders of time evolution with weights that can be done and can be explicitly calculated. In fact, we have two ways of precisely um, determining the, the weights of this evolution giving rise to the two different dialects of this random sampling scheme. But to cut a long story short, so this gives rise to using this randomized scheme to a randomized scheme with very precise error bounds that can be estimated and um, rigorously unbounded from above. Indeed, this does give rise to a resource efficient randomized scheme for digital quantum simulation that brings together the power of multi product formulas and this um, uh, randomized idea that goes back, back to Earl, who's I think in, in, in the audience to kind of bring the best of both worlds together. They have a rather resource efficient randomized scheme for digital quantum simulation, which if one kind of compares the resources needed to Trotter-Zulke or the Charles Weber formula, um, one gets a very favorable scaling of the resources for given errors in several regimes of, mean, of, of, of meaningful settings in, 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 in the time evolution. So indeed, in, in many regimes, the, the error for a given se um, setting for the bounds is very favorable in the two dialects of our multi-product formulas that are being randomized. We've also looked at this for kind of proxy settings of looking at the actual performance for actual Hamiltonians, where again, this is matched in, 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 a, in a very favorable setting in many regimes so that the resource count for a given error is, is indeed scaling um, very favorably. 
So to cut a long story short, this gives rise to a resource efficient randomized scheme for digital quantum simulation. It brings down the effort. Randomness helps. So overcoming the prejudice of determinism of wanting to do the simulation each run, you just say, wait, I just want to have it often. And with overwhelming probability, I want to get the right outcome. This prejudice, this overcoming, the overcoming of this prejudice brings down the effort of quantum simulations quite substantially, which is um, good, good to know. So the whole point of this is that a new multi-product formula can be combined with random sampling methods, kind of bringing together the best of both worlds. And since we don't have to implement the full circuit, but rather controlled Hamiltonian native terms, it's in some way intermediate between analog and digital simulation, or can be seen as a kind of programmable analog simulator, if you want to think in these terms. Surely niskier than previous approaches. It's nice, we have to think more in this direction. It's still a long way. So all the, the, the resources are still quite heavy, but I would like to see this as kind of an invitation to the theorists to work harder to reduce the effort. And this is kind of quite um, providing some hope that one can work hard and, and, and reduce the efforts at hand. So 30 minutes into the talk, which brings me to basically the outlook and the end of the talk. Um, this is rather a reminder or like an, an advertisement of the nice talk of Ersch um, earlier this week that indeed we should in all this excitement of using quantum computers or near-term quantum computers in the context of quantum chemistry, we should not forget that classical methods are improving too and provide pretty heavy and stiff competitive benchmarks to solve these problems as variational principles. And we have seen and learned about um, tensor network methods that approximate inversion principles, the many body Hamiltonian and second quantized form using specific given molecular orbitals that are seen as the qubit system, many body spin or qubit systems that with matrix product state as variational states can be tackled quite nicely. Um, Classically. So these matrix product states take the many body state and chop it into pieces with an extra bond, kind of characterizing the, the correlation structure in the problem, where one can perform ground set calculations with bond dimensions of up to 10,000. Uh, it captures strong correlation effects. It has controlled, in principle, even rigorous, if you want, error bars in calculations, but also um, uh, in, in heuristically, one can find very good understanding of the errors being made, and one can include symmetries and of SU2, U1 point group symmetries. And that's a beautiful idea of matrix product state variation principle. Let's go back to the beautiful work of Stephen White that I think is also in the audience. Um, he has an extremely powerful method of classical variation principles to tackle problems, mostly in condensed matter, but here also in the context of quantum chemistry. The last point I would like to make as a kind of advertisement is that these variational principles over many folds of uh, matrix product states can be augmented by a larger class of states, namely by appropriate fermionic mode transformations where the manifold of matrix product states is completely agnostic to strong correlations but hates loads uh, like large values of entanglement, whereas a mode transformation or the metaplectic representation in Hilbert space if you want is completely agnostic to locality, but hates non-Gaussian operations as such. But you can kind of patch these things together and think of the joint manifold of matrix product states and of mode transformations and can make a joint update of this joint manifold of matrix product states and appropriate fermionic mode transformations. And this is an idea that works quite well. And this is, can be mathematically captured, but also made a practical variational algorithm that builds up on DMRG based variation principles over matrix product states, where you provide competitive answers to um, classical simulations in, in quantum chemistry. Say we looked at the performance of the beryllium six ring of this improved uh, uh, variation principle with more transformations where in the MPS, the image ansatz for the same bond dimension without mode transformations, we got some error on the energy above the true ground state energy. Whereas for the matrix product state simulation with a, a mode update, we found an improvement of two orders of magnitude, which is um, quite an impressive um, 
improvement. So to cut a long story short, tensor network methods, we should not forget, are providing pretty heavy competitive benchmarks in, in quantum chemistry. And tensor network methods are kind of equipped and beefed up with appropriate mode transformations, provide benchmarks that improve upon um, plain vanilla matrix product state updates. So that brings me to the end of my talk. I think I'm also soon um, um, running out of time. So um, in this talk, we looked at notions of making quantum simulations for quantum chemistry more useful, quite in the spirit of this workshop, so I hope. Here's our little quantum computer that we want to kind of make nicely grow and, and water and, and make, make happy. So the quantum computer performing quantum chemistry calculations, a beautiful idea. It's still small, it's, it's warm and wet. We have to do something about it. In the first part of the talk, we found how single shot measurements, it's a basic idea, but can vastly reduce the effort in the classical control of using variational parameters in quantum classical hybrid algorithm that's kind of a beautiful basic idea but that makes the overhead lesser in the second part we found how the idea of randomized quantum simulation can be matched with ideas of multi-product formulas and found how randomized multi-product formulas for give rise to reduced overhead in digital quantum simulation as they can be used in quantum chemistry but in all this excitement we shouldn't forget that the other world is still sitting there and that classical benchmarks give rise to pretty, a classical simulation method give rise to stiff benchmarks in quantum chemistry, and that gives rise to a very nice kind of challenge between the world of quantum simulations in quantum chemistry and classical benchmarks as a kind of interesting, intriguing, competitive situation. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the questions you might potentially have. Thank you very much. Excellent, Jens. Um, Excellent, Jens. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, let's see if we have um, questions. If we have, questions. Um, I guess I, I can preempt the audience since I'm the, uh, since it's the chair for the session. Um, so, Jens, in, in the bounds that you've derived here so far, are these similarly loose? As to, so, the Trotter bounds are known to be quite loose, um, the theoretical Trotter bounds. So, um, is that how does that play out for the bounds that you've derived here? Is that also numerically loose? You're still muted. You're still muted. But I wasn't muted in the talk, was I? No, 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 no. You were muted in the talk. You've got some. You had some echo then, so I think someone might have muted you. Ah, oh, I see. Oh. <laughs> so this reminds me of like lectures, where you start lecturing, and then like you're five minutes into the lecture, and then some students write you a message. Oh, you're muted. Do you know? I said, oh no. <laughs> okay, never mind. I was not muted. That's good. So indeed, yeah, you're right. Trotter bounds are pretty bad. They're I mean, they're rather pessimistic in the way you kind of make an, a worst case rule that you iterate up. And I think that's also the case here. So I think both is true. Our bounds are similarly pessimistic as the Trotter bounds, yet we outperform the Trotter bounds by far in the bounds. And we looked at like meaningful test cases of looking at the actual performance in an actual problem, where we again found a uh, um, substantially improved performance over Trotter, over multi-product formulas, but now in the actual performance. Both are rather better than the rather pessimistic estimates. That's absolutely right. And we have to work harder to bring the bounds closer to the actual performance. That said, the bounds are better than the other bounds and the performance better than the other performance. But yes, right. That's a fair point. It's too pessimistic. Okay, are there other questions from the audience? I guess I've got a bit of a well, self-serving one because we put a little bit of thought into this, but have you considered that um, using error mitigation strategies to try to cancel out some of the algorithmic error in the random simulations? Ah. Um... Yes, um, I mean, that connects to, to a different brain region somehow. I mean, we are thinking of error mitigation schemes and also like benchmarking schemes, but rather in the fully analog context. There indeed one can do such things. I mean, we are looking at like randomized benchmarking in the analog quantum simulation context because, well, this idea of analog simulation makes only sense to the extent you make a valid prediction. 
And we're also looking at, um, at error mitigation schemes in analog simulation. And um, they're not error correcting, but they make use of cancellations of terms. And I would think these ideas would also work in this context. Indeed. But all this is like super new work. I mean, what I've presented is like a couple of days old, so to say. We have not seen how they these ideas perform in this setting. Although I would be not too pessimistic in that, I mean, it's a bit intermediate between analog and digital simulation in that we basically implement Hamilton, the native Hamiltonian terms just controlled by an extra qubit. So in this sense, uh, I'm, I'm quite positive that, that this should work well. But I don't want to oversell. We haven't done the calculation, but of course, these ideas of like, like basically bang bang type of error mitigation in the analog simulation, they would also presumably work in this context. So, so I would, I would hope. I would be interested to hear about your ideas maybe offline, and we can discuss this this more. It wasn't my it wasn't my original idea. I think I, I might even want to attribute it to Sam McArdle, who I think is in the talk. But uh, when we put out a, a recent paper on is on like using swap distillation. Then uh, we, we tried doing that for algorithmic um, technique, like the algorithmic error as well, and it seems to have quite a bit of an improvement. Okay, good, interesting, interesting. I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, the the the, the, the trouble is that um, that uh, I mean, it's 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 hard to leave the 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 heuristic realm here, right? I mean. Of course, these methods um, are expected to perform well, and um, I mean also our setting. I mean, it's 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 nice how the the overhead are being reduced. The overheads are being reduced. That said, if you combine everything, then at the end of the day, you can just basically um, uh, simulate the thing and see how it performs. That's it's a bit hard to come up with with rigorous estimates. So, like mm -hmm. in the analog benchmarking scheme that I that I hinted at, this is kind of nice because one can really find a practical scheme of using tools that people can do in experiments and it's all very native and blah, blah, blah. Yet, you can also do a nice and rigorous uh, error bound by being spam robust, like state preparation and measurement robust. It has all the beautiful features and, and so on. That's great. And that would be a nice kind of language to have. I wouldn't quite see how this would pan out when you put everything together, except you would run a big scale, um, I don't know, tensor network simulation of the whole thing and see how it goes in, in mm -hmm. time, which would be great. I would love to see it. I, think mm -hmm. I, I, I share your sentiment. Although this could be pretty, pretty heavy.